Whether it's ancient combat or modern sport, winning is what it's all about. But how do you win? This man has learned the hard way. Now, he's ready to show you. Ancient warriors dreamed of a long-range weapon that could pierce through a man and his armor with pinpoint accuracy. Such a weapon was created, one of the first handheld mechanical killing machines. Next on Conquest, how to win with the crossbow. Right, gentlemen, you're all skilled in various weapons, but the only skill you're going to need this time is the possession of one eye and two fingers. Let me explain. The crossbow. The Chinese had it by the 6th century BC, the Greeks used it by the 4th century BC, the Romans used it mainly in a heavy siege version called the ballista. After the Romans, there's no firm evidence of it until the 10th century AD, which is where we pick up the story. You're going to be taught how to use the various types of medieval crossbow, which is where you will need your one eye and two fingers. After that, we'll introduce you to the modern high-tech weapon, and you will compete against each other in a final challenge. In medieval times, the crossbow was recorded in 947 AD at the Siege of Saint-Lys, where it caused heavy casualties. When the Normans invaded England in 1066, the crossbow went with them. Soon after that date, the crossbow became the major missile weapon in Europe. So how was the crossbow invented? Well, I think this is one possible answer. If you accidentally draw a bow with too short an arrow, the arrow can get hooked up behind the bow. Now, some early archer must have realized this could be quite useful. The energy of the bow is now stored. All I need to do is find some way of mechanically releasing that energy. Now, if I replace my arm with a piece of wood and make some kind of trigger mechanism to release the arrow, well then, I got myself a crossbow. The earliest medieval crossbow was called an arbalest. A short bow stave of yew or elm, often protected by skin, was lashed into a wooden stock or tiller. About halfway along the tiller was this rotating catch, the nut. This was made of brass or horn. At the bottom of the nut, there is a notch, and into that notch went the trigger, this Z-shaped mechanism here. The string was pulled back to engage with the nut. A little pressure on the trigger, would release the nut and send the string flying forward. Now, the crossbow was loaded or spanned by placing a foot under the bow stave and, and drawing the string back onto the nut. The bolt was then placed inside the string and the whole thing was released by a touch on the trigger. So what was the advantage of the crossbow over the much simpler bow? Mike, you're an archer, you take my bow, there's some arrows there for you. Darth, take the crossbow, there's some bolts there. You can kneel down and rest on this. Now from behind those hay bales over there, a head is going to appear at some point over the next few minutes, like that. And I want you guys, at point-blank range, to shoot it, all right? While Mike and Darth take aim and wait for their target to appear, Dan and Phil learn about the types of arrow shot by the crossbow. A crossbow fires a short arrow called a bolt or a quarrel. It's laid along this groove cut on the top of the tiller. And these are generally made of yew or ash. They have two or three fletchings at the back. Some of the fletchings were spiralled to give the bolt a spin in flight. Now this one is designed to punch through plate armour. A slightly longer, thinner point would be best against mail. And then there's a whole range of broadheads. These are for use against unarmoured soldiers and the need for hunting. The quarrels and bolts were kept in a quiver, a box that was hung from the belt. Any luck yet? Nope, not yet. Although the early arbalest was primitive compared to later, more powerful crossbows, the effect of this weapon on the battlefield was huge. It was absolutely deadly, especially at close range. This was a revolution in armament, as important in its day as the gun was to later generations. It was the first handheld mechanical killing machine. 
Just look at that guy over there with the bow. The hand bow required muscular strength and steadiness. It cannot be held at full draw for any length of time. Whereas with the crossbow... You got it. I just pulled the trigger. My arm was hurting and when I went to relax it, the target came up and I wasn't ready. Well, that's just the point. The crossbow was ready. And look at you. You have to stand up to use your weapon. You're an open target. The crossbowman can kneel behind cover and take his shot when the target appears. The crossbowman even had his own special type of shield. It was called a pavis. He would carry it on his back, move into position, and then set it up on this stand. Then he could span his bow safely behind the protection of the shield. He could then shoot it, still protected. Now, many medieval battles were sieges, and the crossbow was an ideal weapon either to attack a castle or to defend it. It just depended which side had more crossbowmen. The arbalest, once spanned, could be fired at leisure without effort. It merely required alignment and the correct elevation for the distance of a chosen target. But there's more. So, had you shot that crossbow before? First time. Well, why don't you all have a go? As I said, a good bowman needs physical strength and a lifetime of practice. But with a crossbow, anyone can be taught how to load, aim and shoot with reasonable accuracy in a very short space of time. This was the first really effective missile weapon to be widely available to common soldiers who were unskilled and who needed very little training. Most importantly, the crossbow could fire a bolt which flew faster, further, more accurately and with greater penetration than any archer's arrow of the period. In 1099, during the First Crusade, Anna Komnena, daughter of the Byzantine Emperor, wrote, They not only pierce through a shield, but also pierce a man and his armour, through and through. The crossbow was subject to continuous development and improvement, especially in loading techniques. The first improvement was this, the stirrup fitted to the head of the tiller. This was placed on the ground, the foot was placed inside it, and this made the pull of the string much easier. As crossbows became more powerful, they required stronger methods of loading or spanning. The first of these was the spanning belt. This was simply a belt with a hook attached. The crossbowman places crossbow on the ground, kneel down, put the hook over the bowstring, and then he could use the full force of his body to pull that string up. Further refinement was to put the hook on a pulley, which moved along a cord. One end of this was attached to the belt, and the other to a peg on the tiller. The body pulled the string back as before, but the pulley gave a two-to-one mechanical advantage. From around 1300, the metal workers of Europe discovered how to make bow stays of steel, of relatively high resilience. Now, these were a great improvement, but they were expensive, and they required some extremely skilled metalworking. The bowstay was usually held in a recess cut in the front of the tiller, and it was either bound on with cords or secured by a system of braces and wedges. There we are. These more powerful crossbows required a much stronger spanning system to load them. Now, the windlass was a metal frame that attached over the butt end of the tiller, Connected to it was this drum with two winding handles, connected to a couple of cords and a whole system of pulleys. At the business end were these two hooks. They hooked over the bowstring, and then the windlass itself was wound up. The string is pulled backwards over the nut, and when it reaches that point, you want to check that the trigger is fully engaged. Now the windlass is wound down, to engage the bowstring onto the nut, and the windlass itself is then removed. Now, at last, we have a really powerful crossbow with a mechanical spanning system, a truly deadly weapon. As the crossbow spread, so did the horror that this weapon inspired. It wasn't just that it was so deadly, it was that now a common peasant could, at long range, pierce the finest male and kill a member of the nobility. Just that it was so deadly, it was that now a common peasant could, at long range, 
pierce the finest male and kill a member of the nobility. It's not surprising that the knightly classes opposed this weapon. In 1139, Pope Innocent II declared, the deadly art, hated of God, of crossbowmen and archers, should not be used against Christians and Catholics on pain of anathema. Of course, Muslims and infidels were fair game. But no one could stop the use of such a great weapon. It was a favorite of King Richard I of England. He used it against Muslims and Christians alike. At the siege of Chalouz in 1199, he was mortally wounded by a crossbow bolt, which some saw as God's punishment. Coming up, our team learns to use the various types of ancient crossbow and gets to compare them with other weapons. Today, our team, dressed as mercenaries of the Middle Ages, practice loading and firing the medieval crossbow. The crossbowman played a pivotal role in many battles of the Middle Ages. From his position at the forefront and on the wings of the battle, his main purpose was to stop the advance of the enemy, especially cavalry. The main disadvantage of the crossbow was the slow rate of fire. Only two shots a minute from a really powerful weapon, but it had great penetrating power and accuracy. It remained effective up to 200 yards, though the penetrating power decreased with the distance. This could be a devastating weapon. In 1314, the mayor of London raised a force of 120 crossbowmen. The crossbows cost 41 pennies, the baldricks 12 pennies, the quivers 3 pennies. There were 4,000 crossbow bolts at a bargain price of 240 pennies, a helmet and collaret of iron at 61 pennies, and a hackathon or armoured coat at 81 pennies. But you guys, the crossbowmen, were only paid four pennies a day. Four pennies? Well, what skills have you got? Oh, well, I can, I can aim and squeeze that trigger thing. Well, exactly. Anyone can do that. Now, your kit may have been expensive, but you guys were dirt cheap. In England, the crossbow had already been superseded by the longbow. This was the only weapon which had anywhere near the range and penetration of the crossbow. But the longbow needed a high level of strength and training that only the English achieved. But in Europe, the crossbow was perceived very differently. It was used by highly trained and well-armored mercenaries. The Genoese, in particular, were renowned for their skill and steadfastness. Mounted crossbowmen were regarded as elite troops and often formed the personal bodyguards of kings. But medieval crossbowmen must have had problems with these old designs, especially the windlass. One answer is to make a faster loading crossbow. The Kranekin is a rack and pinion device. Inside this case is a toothed wheel which engages on this toothed bar with a double hook on the end. The bar is wound down to collect the string. It's then wound up again to pull the string back onto the nut. In this position, you ensure that the trigger is fully engaged and then you wound down the Kranekin once again. Kranekin was removed, bolt placed in the bow. Now, the Kranekin was much more manageable than the windlass and because you didn't have to rest the bow on the ground, a mounted crossbowman could now use a much more powerful weapon. But it remained fairly slow to load, but now there were alternatives. It's time to try a test. Here we have the windlass crossbow, Kranekin crossbow. I will have a long bow. This is a short bow used everywhere. We archers would need years of training. Here's a handgun of about 1450 and a matchlock musket of about 1550. Now the firearms are complicated to load but relatively easy to aim and fire. We've got three targets. The first one at 20 yards, where we'll see which weapons can penetrate it. Next one is at 40 yards, which we'll see which weapons can reach it and how many can penetrate it. And the final one is at 60 yards. I want you to shoot, loose and fire as much as you can. Are you ready? Ready. ready. The team shoots at the first target 20 yards away. All the projectiles hit the armoured dummy. The guns make some nice holes, and the longbow and the crossbows are close enough to pick off the ideal target, the face. But the arrows from the short bow just bounce off. Even at this close range, this weapon requires a well-aimed shot to an unarmoured part of the body. So the short bow is eliminated. Next, the second target at 40 yards. 
After three tries, the longbow finally strikes the target. The matchlock hits with ease. Both crossbows are accurate enough to strike the target, but don't quite penetrate the heavy armor. The handgun is completely inaccurate and is eliminated. For the third target at 60 yards, my longbow should certainly be able to penetrate the armor, if I can hit it. I shoot plenty of arrows, but I miss, which eliminates the longbow and leaves the crossbows and the matchlock. The crossbowmen have to carefully adjust the elevation and allow for windage, which is the effect of any side wind on the bolt. One bolt actually does hit the target, but with so little power that it bounces off. The matchlock hits and punches straight through the armor. The crossbow loses out, making the matchlock the superior weapon. In its time, the crossbow was a remarkable weapon, but it was only really effective against plate armor up to about 60 yards. It performed just as well as the longbow in everything except the crucial rate of fire, but it required much less skill to learn how to use it. But neither of these weapons could match up to the growing power of the gun. With the introduction of firearms, the military crossbow was practically obsolete after 1550. From then on, crossbows were used mostly for hunting or target shooting by the leisured classes. Right, gentlemen. It's only in the last 50 years, with the introduction of modern high-tech materials, that the design, construction and power of the crossbow has seen revolutionary change. For you to experience the modern crossbow, we've come here to the Valley West Archers range. Take up a bow. Let's get to work. Otis Snyder, who represents Horton Crossbows, instructs the team on how to use today's state-of-the-art crossbows fitted with scopes, which help the shooter focus more accurately. Hi, team. Before we start to shoot the crossbow, there are a few basics you're going to have to pick up on. Number one, and probably the most important, is the safety. Safety's ambidextrous left or right on the crossbow. Must be in the fire position to cock. Out front of the bow, there are grooves at the forearm and the crossbow. Those are for your thumbs and fingers. Keep them in there. Basic way of cocking the crossbow, step into the stirrup up to the ball of your foot. I try to put my chest right down on the stock, get my index fingers along the rail, use all four fingers on each hand, all the way back to the latch. Crossbow is then cocked, automatically goes in a safe position when it's cocked. The methods for spanning the crossbow are the same now as they have always been. The straight pull, the hook and pulley, and the windlass. But our team still has difficulties. Coming up, our team faced their final challenge with some of the most powerful crossbows on Earth. Gentlemen, time for your final challenge. Gentlemen, time for your final challenge. We've set up targets at 20, 40, and 60 yards. Between 20 and 60 yards, your arrow will drop by six feet. Inside your scope, you'll see a heavy horizontal line. That is zeroed in at 20 yards. Each line below that represents another 10 yards of elevation. Work it out. You're gonna shoot in pairs, two shots at each target. And the two guys with the winders are up first. Off you go. Although they will shoot in pairs, it's every man for himself. So may the best crossbowman win. Dan and Phil go first. Considering the little training they've had, they do okay. And both get two hits. At this close range, Mike and Darth seem confident. They also get two hits each. After target one, all team members are tied with two points each. Moving to target two, each team member has to deal with an increased elevation. The lines inside the scope make it easier, but their inexperience causes mistakes. Dan and Phil give it a go. Dan earns two hits, but Phil only gets one. Darth remains steady and gets two hits, but Mike only gets one. Six arrows out of eight hit target two. Dan and Darth are in the lead, 
each with four hits. Tension builds as the team tackles target three, the bear. Dan and Phil find 60 yards a difficult range, but Dan still manages to get two hits. Phil, on the other hand, only scores one. Mike lacks concentration and makes only one hit, but Darth maintains his focus and strikes the bear twice. The team doesn't know it, but there is no clear leader after target three. All right, guys, those are your fixed targets. Now for your surprise. You're going to have a moving target behind those hay bales across your line of fire. There'll be a mark for the bullseye. Whoever is closest to the bullseye gets double points. Shoot! The team has finished the conquest challenge. Now let's tally up the scores. All right, gentlemen, let's have a look at the ball. Right, this arrow is the closest and it belongs to... Darth, who wins the contest. Well done. Requiring a unique combination of human skills and mechanical artifice, the crossbow is a remarkable weapon. It's also a great modern sport, and our team have really enjoyed learning how to win with the crossbow.